All right, guys, let me get into my haves and the have-nots review. For the past few episodes of this season, I hadn't been doing the reviews because I thought the pacing of the show was a little slow, but it picks up this week, so hence I'm back doing my reviews. So, we start out from last week where we left off with Hannah getting it on with Michael. They're in the bed, and Hannah's like, oh, well, what if my son comes home? He's going to come home. And Michael's like, do you want me to stop? And Hannah's like, no. And we saw last week that she was considering stopping. She was kind of conflicted as far as her principles go. And we know this is Hannah with some out. She's a super Christian and very, very principled and all that. And she holds tight to her principles. So what happens uh, uh, then is that Benny does come home, and excuse me, I shift this around a bit to get better. Ready. Benny does come home, so he uh, goes in the refrigerator looking for something to eat, and he hears noises coming from his mom's bedroom. Now, for most children of any age, especially of an adult age. Hearing those sort of noises coming from your parents' bedroom is going to send you running out the house and you ain't going to stop running until you hit the hills of Tennessee. But no, not Benny. Benny goes and opens the door. Benny gets an eye full. Ooh, mama! He slams the door and clearly Hannah is embarrassed. So from there, we end up back at, um, we transition, the scene transitions over to, um, Candace and Jeffrey. And this is post-Veronica's visit. And Veronica, she's, uh, we already know that she said that she wanted Candace out. And Jeffrey knows that she ha is up to something, Veronica's up to something. So he wants Candace to leave. He offers to put her up at a hotel, give her money for that. Uh, and Candace wants to know exactly what it is that uh, Veronica has on Jeffrey, but Jeffrey's not getting up off of any information. And Jeffrey wants to know how Candace knew about his father coming out of a room with Maggie. And Candace says, well, I had somebody watching the hotel, and I had them steal Maggie's phone because I wanted some information. And Jeffrey's like, why would you do that? Hmm. Like, Candace is not telling why she did that because Jeffrey won't get up off of his information about what his mother has over his head. But Candace is not in the sharing mood. So she gives him some advice. The best way to get your mother off your back is to break her. And she can tell that Jeffrey has never struggled before. Like, not have, like, not knowing where his next meal was coming from, not having shelter, blah, 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 all that. And uh, she tr she really, as usual, she tries to give Jeffrey advice, but Jeffrey's not prepared to stand up to his mama yet. So from there, we end up back. Let's check the notes. Ooh, ooh, give me a minute, a second. We end up at the campaign office where... Maggie's getting everything together for the announcement. Jim's not there yet because Candy's got him hostage. But nobody knows this except Jim and Candy. So um, Maggie's getting everything together and this reporter from New York comes in. She came down. I, Maggie convinced her to come down. But this reporter's not interested in talking about the local issue. She wants to talk about uh, the hit and run. She wants to ask Jim questions about that, but Maggie says uh, Jim's probably not going to be inclined to talk about that, but the reporter is insistent. She wants four questions about it. Maggie wants less than that. Maggie wants to see the questions. The reporter says no. So basically, the reporter called all the shots and went on about her way. So Maggie spots this other reporter there and says, well, she's going to ask about gay rights. Keep her away from the Harrington. Veronica has a big problem with that issue. Uh, Maggie lets on that she knows that David is not of the same mind as Veronica, and Landon kind of want to know, kind of wants to know why 
Maggie knows that, but Maggie plays coy just as Landon tried to play coy, pretending that he uh, didn't know that Jeffrey is gay. And but Maggie called herself a crafty little angel, something like that. And so they're definitely political operatives, because you can see that they're kind of like her. They were even with their little conversation, there were just all sorts of gears and stuff turning. So we get back to Hannah's house, and Hannah, this is her and Michael have stopped, and she's real thankful that they stopped because she don't want to do anything to compromise her principles. And uh, despite rolling around, I guess she's just she feels like that was she can get past that as long as she didn't do the full act and. Michael goes on about his business, but then Hannah comes up against Big Mouth Benny. Benny's mouth has just been so... It's been so loud and so brash since he came out of that coma. He's saying, he was saying all sorts of things to his mother. Well, if I wasn't worried about seeing you naked, I'd have busted that fool in the back of his head and jumped it back in the gutter where you found it. You were getting ready to spread your legs for some stranger. You should be ashamed of yourself. And Hannah's like, Benjamin, you are smelling yourself. And she she stays calm, but she tells him, puts him in her place, that she's an adult and that he is not to talk to her like that. So he leaves to go cool off. And, you know, Hannah is in agreement with him leaving to go cool off because... He would have said some more stuff that he would regret, and Hannah probably would say something that she would regret, and, you know, neither one of them wanted that. So, after that, let me check to see where we went after that. So, uh, how did we go to those? So, we go to this, uh, David and Maggie have this little scene, and, you know, they still seem to have a little bit of a something. Chemistry or something going on, and I said you might as well have gone through with it. Veronica went crazy anyway, and Maggie got slapped in the face, and not even for doing the full act, just for rolling around a bit. So, and uh, Veronica didn't even believe that they didn't do it. So, but whatever, that was a short little scene between David and Maggie. So, next we'll transfer to the. Cryer Mansion where uh, Catherine um, uh, is trying to wake Wyatt up and Celine is uh, Celine tells Catherine that Wyatt drank all this scotch and Catherine tries to get him up but he's laid out in the bed being a petulant child like she's trying to get him up for school because he's going to miss the school bus but he doesn't want to get up and go to this announcement. So, and I don't necessarily blame him, but he was quite disrespectful to his mama. Uh, so she tries to get ready to go wake up Amanda, and but we and we'll get to that. But uh, uh, but she and then she uh, and Hannah's back at work, and so she runs into Hannah, Catherine, and they have a little conversation. But before that. Celine and Hannah mixed it up a little bit. Celine's being her usual self, being confrontational, but Hannah was not having it. So let's get into Catherine and Hannah's scene. So Catherine fills Hannah in on Quincy stopping by the Cryer Mansion and giving Jim a beat down. And Catherine was just so excited about this. She was like, whoa, he did what I wanted to do to Jim for so many years. I should pay him to come by every Friday and beat Jim up. And um, at first Hannah didn't know exactly who she was talking about, but then when uh, Ka I believe Catherine said something about it being a friend of Candace's, uh, Hannah realized that it was a Qu and it was Quincy, and Hannah said, well, that boy is a message of death. He's dangerous. And Catherine's like, <laughs> he didn't do nothing to me. He liked me, and then she goes, "Well, not like that, but I Quincy is so thirsty he probably would 
get with Catherine if possible. So I, he's been in prison so long, so I wouldn't be surprised if he did look at Catherine like that. But who knows? So uh, Hannah's a little bit disturbed by Catherine's sense of humor and. Catherine really doesn't want Hannah raining on her parade and all of that. Uh, Kat, that's the other thing Catherine, Catherine said, that Jim getting beat up got her turned on. Bizarro. But, you know, so Kat, Hannah goes to get to work and Catherine um, has to finish getting dressed, but she instructed a cat, uh, Hannah to get Amanda up in a half hour or so, so she can get to the announcement, get dressed, and get to the announcement. And we'll get into Amanda later on in this review. So, uh, Catherine, uh, in the, so, okay, Cat, okay, we'll get to Catherine's other scene. Because after this, Jeffrey has to deal with Melissa again. Because Melissa shows up at his door and she's like, Hi. And Jeffrey's like, What are you doing here? Because he's not trying to see her right now. And he says, your mother told me to come over so we could go over together. Oh, Veronica, still being extra pushy. So, uh, Melissa's being real persistent. She's, she's talking about she really likes Jeffrey. And she's really pouring it on heavy. It's quite a bit much. It seems quite rehearsed, and Jeffrey gets a big red flag when Melissa says, Well, you just have to do it over and over and over again until it becomes more natural. And Jeffrey kind of goes off and's like, How much have you been talking to my mother? And he's getting a little slight backbone, but he needs to get that backbone with Veronica. But of course, Melissa doesn't fess up to anything, but I suspected from last season that uh, Veronica put Melissa up to getting Jeffrey into bed. So, uh, and you remember, they didn't use protection, so there probably is a potential for a pregnancy to occur. So, and Veronica would love that, because she could really really uh, trap Jeffrey into something in a situation like that. Uh, from there, we go back to the Cryer Mansion to make sure that's where the scene transitions to. Yeah, and so Wyatt is up out of bed looking a mess. Looking like he smells terrible. Uh, so he's just being real disrespectful to his mother, telling her, Go to hell! And that's exactly how he said it. I said, You and Benny are out of line in this episode. And granted, Wyatt has a whole lot of guilt about what he did with the hit and run, and he doesn't, I don't think he, he really sees his parents as him having done him a favor by covering it up because he mentions that. He said, What did you help me get away with? What did you do for me? Help me get away with murder. <coughs> Excuse me. So clearly he, he's still feeling guilt about that. And then he lays all this stuff out about Jim and blah, blah, blah. Because uh, Catherine tries to call Jim to straighten him out. And when she calls him, his... It, it, it rings and she hears it and Wyatt has his phone and she says what are you doing with his phone and oh Wyatt says oh I found it outside he probably dropped it when he went out to screw candy and then he, he just dumps all this stuff out that Catherine already knows about Celine about Celine having a son and all of that stuff and um and, and and the funny thing about the scene to me is he called Wyatt called Celine once by her name and then he said, Well maybe I should call her by the name she knows. Poor and then Celine sort of appears right away and I said, Perfect timing, Celine. Perfect timing. <laughs> so 
so Catherine can't get through to why he's just being a big, big jerk. And, but he does make a valid point about them having alcohol all around the house when he has a substance abuse problem. Okay, and so we transition back to the campaign office, and Maggie's getting real concerned that Jim hasn't showed up yet, and we know why he hasn't showed up yet, but nobody else does. Uh, so she, um, David hasn't been able to get a hold of him, and that's because uh, Jim does not have his phone with him. And so Veronica shows up, and She's acting like everything's perfect, nothing happened. She even tells Maggie that she does an exceptional job, and then she pauses. Maggie says, thank you, and then Veronica does a little pause, and she tells her, then go do it. Uh, Veronica didn't even want Maggie in the same room with her husband. And <laughs> Honestly, I don't even feel bad for Veronica um, at and for her for having walked in on what she did and she kind of deserved it because she's been real vicious real vicious vicious towards her son and then she blamed him for the whole mess and it's just a mess so uh jim uh i mean david asked veronica to call uh catherine so to see if catherine can get a hold of jim and so Catherine tries to, uh, to get a hold of him, and it was so hilarious how she had him in her phone. She had him under her, in her phone, under a very bad name, and oh, Catherine can't stand Jim. But, um, of course, she forgot that Wyatt still has his phone, so she doesn't know where he's at, and nobody knows where he's at, because Candy got him hostage. So, wrapping this up real quick, Candace has Jim hostage, and she's ready for him to sign the papers, and she takes out the papers and everything, and he says, well, he's, he's ready to sign as well, and he said, well, I need my hands free. So, she, she should have known he was up to something, but, so, but she lets him have his hands free, and he proceeds to choke her. But Candace is quick enough to turn on that electrical machine that she shocked him with last week. And he gets an electric shock, so he has to let go, and he has to sign the papers. And Candace set up a wire transfer request at her bank. Uh, and she makes Jim call his banker to approve the request. And so she's going to get her $7.4 million. I think it was $7.4 million, somewhere in that range. She's ready to get it, and she's gonna let Jim take a shower and have clean clothes and everything. And Warlock is like, "Why?" And she says, "Because we wa I want to wash, get him washed off, so we can kill him." And then she's like, "I know we can really kill him." And, and she said, "Well, I've got him broken and all that." And so from there, uh, let's let me uh, make sure I'm getting there. I'm not missing anything. I don't want to miss anything. Okay, and so this, after that scene with Jim and Candace, the end arrives. So Hannah, as per Catherine's instructions, goes to wake up Amanda. She knocks on the door, no answer. So she, Hannah says, well, your mother said I got to get you up physically. So Hannah goes in to open up her blinds and then to let in some light. And as soon as she does that, she opens the, she slips on something. And it's like, uh oh. And then she looks around, blood everywhere. She's just like, ooh, just like really like grossed out. And, and, and just blood everywhere. And she looks over, sees Amanda in the bed, shot, all this blood. And. And, and, and that's the cliffhanger for this week. Just a great, great cliffhanger. I loved it. Um, so next week we're going to be dealing with the aftermath of Amanda's shooting. Um, uh, she's got to be dead after that. I mean, it's like all that blood in there. I mean, it'd be stupid to have her come back as alive. But you never know with a soap soap. 
But that is my review. Thank you all for watching. I'm going to be back, back next week because it looks like the show is going to be fast-paced again. So thank you very much for watching my review and deuces.